are going the right way. Uh, our CEO was born and raised in Nepal, so we feel uh, very connected with, uh, with the team there in Nepal. And in fact, um, here is our team uh, in Nepal as of February, uh, which was when I was uh, last in Nepal um, and had a chance to, to work closely with our team there. And since we take, took this photo two months ago, we've effectively tripled the team. Uh, so it continues to grow uh, very nicely. We're very excited about uh, the future in, in, uh, in Nepal. And so this picture here is sort of like, uh, this was taken at an air show a few years ago. The reason I included this is everybody showed up here. It was a nice day. People were going to enjoy an air show. Everything was going fine. And then something went horribly wrong. And this is the exact instant when the pilot uh, ejected and uh, things uh, you know, went, went, uh, went, went, went horribly awry. Fortunately, the pilot was fine. Nobody got hurt. The, the $10, $10 million plane was uh, destroyed, of course. But that's a lot like what happened to us. Everything was going along fine. Our economies were good. Our workforces were doing fine. Um, and then this pandemic came along and just simply changed everything for us. So, you know, there's the, there's the health aspect, right? 2.6 million cases, 175,000 deaths globally. Um, I understand it's not had as much uh, impact in, in Nepal, but you all see the headlines. Um, and so it's got the attention of, uh, of our workforce. It's on the minds and weighing on the hearts of our employees. But beyond the um, health aspects, there's the financial impact. Um, so millions of jobs lost and businesses will go bankrupt. Um, uh, in the U.S., 26 million people are, uh, are now unemployed. And we have 350 million people. This is about the, effectively the size of uh, the population of Nepal is now not working in the U.S. Uh, we have people protesting in the streets in multiple states because they're frustrated. They want to go back to work. They don't want to lose their businesses and their livelihoods. Um, schools, you know, the, the educational impact uh, is, is being felt. Uh, I'm on the board of education at my school district. We've lost a lot of educational days and we're probably going to be closed down for the rest of the school year here, which means through the end of June. Um, so that's a lot of lost opportunity when you only get that opportunity once in the life of a student. Uh, there's the mental health aspect. Uh, suicides are rising around the country here in the U.S. Uh, domestic violence is up. Uh, so lots of other things beyond the, uh, you know, contracting the flu and, 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 uh, and, and the the seriousness of that situation. And, and on a more personal level, I think I put in my bio that I, I play a little poker. This is, the, this is my local poker room. It stands uh, quietly there with nobody in it. And in fact, the World Series of Poker was just postponed. So uh, it's touching uh, all, all aspects of life now. And we all may, you know, just a quick history lesson, we all probably remember, uh, it started like this. Back in uh, when this was done on January 20th, this was from the World Health Organization. Um, you know, it was largely a China thing. Uh, and then, of course, a week later, um, it was several thousand cases, again, predominantly uh, based in China. A month later, um, now we're up to you know, tens of thousands of cases, again, mostly, mostly in China. But then two months later, suddenly we've got a quarter million cases uh, all over the place. And now today, 2.5 million cases, 175,000 deaths. So it's, it's you know, we, we all know the, know the recent history. So one of the things that we, you know, we want to think about, and I'll, I'll get into five key workforce strategies in a moment, but one thing to think about is how local is the virus and how much is it on the minds and, and, and a concern of our employees. So if, you're, if you live in New York, like I do, this is kind of what it looks like. We're, you know, we've become sort of the epicenter of the crisis, uh, New York City in particular, and some of the communities surrounding New York City. So our headquarters for, for K&A is in Westchester. Okay, so you can see, you know, the number of folks who've tested positive for COVID-19. You can see the deaths. Uh, if you're me, I, I hope that I can show at the bottom there. I'm in Saratoga County, um, where it's much smaller. The infection rate is, you know, uh, is 22 times uh, in Westchester where it is where I live. So I experienced the virus and the epidemic a little bit di differently than those that are that are right there. Our workforce that's in Westchester, it's a big deal. The National Guard has been deployed nearby. It's a much more active threat. In Nepal, um, largely there's not a lot of uh, activity, right? So you got 45 cases in the entire uh, country. Um, and when you think about comparing the rate of infection in Nepal with the rate of infection in Westchester County, New York, uh, Westchester County, uh, you're 17,000 more times more likely <laughs> to be infected based upon the current trend. So again, the, our proximity, um, you know, to the to the illness will somewhat drive, you know, how our folks uh, are feeling about this. Let's start talking about some workforce strategies. Now, I've been through, you know, a few uh, pandemics. I, I, I uh, 
I've been around for SARS and MRSA, uh, the swine flu in 2009, the, the uh, mad cow disease in 1996. Despite how old my wife thinks I am, I wasn't around for the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, but uh, this pandemic is uh, certainly like no other that we've, uh, we've encountered. But the first step is to think like an employee. And this is always a good idea. But in this time, it's really important to be you know, taking on that, that perception. And just you know, in, in quieter times, let's say pre-pandemic, uh, you know, what do employees really want? And there's generally a bit of a disconnect between what employers think employees want and what employees actually do want. You'll notice the top three under the employer side has no correlation to the uh, employee side. There's no match in the top three on, e on either side. So really understanding what our employees want is really important. And how do we do that? We talk to our employees, we survey our employees, uh, and then we, then we align ourselves with what our employees' needs are. So that's always a good idea. It's ultra important. Uh, and, and right now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we do that. Um, when we think about, you know, uh, uh, thinking like an employee, you know, what, uh, what makes a great employee? So why does someone come to work for your company? What keeps them happy and keeps them wanting to come to that company, to your company and be, be productive? Uh, why does that person stay at your company? Uh, and, and then, you know, the risk the, of, of losing that talent uh, what do you think it might take for that employee to leave? When are they going to answer that call from a headhunter uh, or a recruiter and actively entertain the idea of leaving your company and going somewhere else? And then how can you reverse engineer? There's that concept of everyday recruitment, making sure we're connecting with our, as, as managers, we're connecting with our people, as HR leaders, we're, we're encouraging those connections to happen so that people feel valued, feel welcome. Going back to the previous slide, that they're, they're feeling in on things, um, that people are sympathetic to their personal problems, you know, that, that we're connecting with our folks. Um, and then how can we how can pull that forward and, and incorporate it into the recruitment or talent acquisition process? So going back to the pandemic, let's think about things. As we go through these phases, so think about late January, you know, if you can put yourself back at that time frame, three months ago, um, you know, COVID seemed like a distant thing. It was kind of a water cooler topic. You know, we might talk about the cricket match last night. We might say, hey, did you hear about that thing going on in China? You know, it was, you know, kind of a, you know, something that didn't seem like it was, you know, ever going to, you know, be part of who we are. And then all of a sudden, a month later, when you've got the cases growing rapidly, you know, now our employees are starting to say, hey, this is getting serious. It's starting to spread. Well, this ultimately, could this impact or affect me? And then when it started to become a global phenomenon about a month ago, now people are starting to think this is everywhere. Uh, and for a lot of people, it was, starting to, it was starting to have a real personal impact. My job is different. I'm not going to an office anymore. I'm working from home. My kid's school has been canceled. Now they're home too. We're all stuck here because we can't go anywhere because of various levels of lockdown, right? Uh, child care issues, um, elder care issues, trying to take care of aging parents, you know, so suddenly there's a lot more you know, workforce implication and employee related matters we need to be thinking about. And now we get to today, you know, some of us have been on lockdown here in New York, we've been on lockdown for six weeks. You know, will this ever end? Uh, is my job safe? As, as uh, you know, things develop within, the, within our companies, maybe our sales are down, maybe our clients are putting things on hold that they were originally moving forward with, maybe that new uh, opportunity has been pushed out a ways. Uh, and cabin fever, I mean, there's just the mental effect of this prolonged, you know, staring at the same people, the same pets, the same four walls, and, you know, we're, we're humans. We're, we're not designed to be trapped uh, in, in the houses. And so, you know, the weather gets nice, and yet we're still stuck inside, et cetera. So the way our employees are experiencing this, it's important for us to stay really tuned into that. Um, so, uh, so what are some things we can do as in response to that? So when our employees are thinking about back when the you know, back in late January, um, all we're really doing at that point is kind of monitoring developments. Okay, we're tuned in, something's happening, let's see if it's gonna go anywhere, become a bigger issue. Well, it did. So now two months ago, now we're focused on business readiness. Wait a minute, this thing might not get contained. This might, this might come to our doorstep. If it does, what are we gonna do? If we have to, go, if we have to re work remotely, how ready are we to do that? What tools do we need to put in place? What processes, what training, et cetera? Um, and then when it moves to where it was about a month ago and everything's shutting down and you know, jobs are starting to be lost and you know, kids are staying home from school, now there wants to be more active communication going on. We'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, always first, top of mind is employee safety. 
all right? We can worry about whether we're going to make money at this company. We can worry about whether we're going to, you know, grow the, grow the business or enter a new market. That's all fine and dandy for a different day. This day becomes about safety. Are you okay? Do you, here, here's, here's what we can tell you about how to avoid uh, the virus. Here's what we're going to do in our workplaces. We started doing things with hand sanitizers and wiping down computer keyboards and, you know, just taking some extra precautions as this thing was getting more serious. Uh, company resources that are available uh, or, or benefits. So maybe you've got an employee assistance program that can help with mental health or, or, or concerns people have. Maybe, they, you know, in our case, our U.S. health program had different things that they were starting to pay for uh, when it came to getting tested for the virus and treatment. Um, additional, uh, in the case of the U.S., there was uh, additional sick leave available. So letting our employees know that that's available to them and how to, how to get access to that. Um, there was additional unemployment benefits for those that started to become affected. So making sure they know how to register for those benefits and get those, et cetera. And really that, that, that last bullet here, we are here for you. So we can try and anticipate, we can think like an employee, but we don't know everybody's personal situation. So if there's something we can be doing better as an employer, let us know, being available, having managers check in and make sure people are okay. That really becomes critical. As we're in the current stage, which is hopefully the, the, the tail end here, uh, there's really, we, we really need to continue to be transparent about, about the impact. So in our business, you know, we're, we're like just about every other business. We, we're not unscathed. We've had some things, and I'll talk about it. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but making sure people understand this is what's happening. This is how we're responding. This is what our commitment is to you as our employees, uh, that you're going to come first. Uh, that employees first mentality is really important with letting them know that they matter and we're not going to put, you know, profits above people. Um, finding and sharing positive examples. So as we're going through this together, I'll, I'll share an example of one of our employees making face masks for healthcare workers and, and uh, having a really inspiring story about that. And there is, you know, other various examples that we, that we had is where we you know, find those um, positive moments and share those because people need an uplift. Even, even we had our last all hands meeting and our very first slide was the birth of a newborn to one of our employees. And that got everybody feeling good for, for a minute there. So that's, th those kind of things are really helpful. Um, devastating empathy, we get it. This is hard, we're in this together. We're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna figure this out. Uh, and the part about sharing mental health resources, just making sure people know that if, uh, if it's getting to be a little overwhelming, um, you know, there's some ways that we can help you with that. So the second workforce strategy, and there's five if you wanna keep score, um, is culture matters. And this is your company culture, right? Not necessarily Holly culture, but, but your, your company's individual culture. So what is culture? So, you know, there's lots of definitions. Here's a, here's a few that resonate with me. Maybe they will with you. You know, how people inside the organization interact with each other, right? So how do we treat each other? How do we work together? How do we, uh, you know, rely on each other, trust each other, have each other's back, et cetera. Uh, it's learned behavior. It's not a byproduct of operations. You can't, you can't legislate culture. Culture happens as a result of how uh, the leadership team acts, how people work with each other, etc. And finally, it's the way it feels to work at an organization. Uh, now, I, I've worked more places than I care to think about in my career. And there are some companies I remember walking into uh, where it was just like, hey, this is great. I feel I, I can't wait to get going every day. And we've all been maybe at one of these companies where you walk in, it's just like, how much longer do I have to endure this place, right? And so that, that you, you know when you're working at a place with a healthy culture, and likewise, you know when you're working at a place that has an unhealthy culture. So let's talk about why culture matters. So there's a saying I like to use, during good times, you learn how good an organization is. During bad times, you learn how great an organization is. It's easy to be good when times are good. Right. That's that's just that's 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 the easy stuff. But when when a crisis hits, when a problem arises, how do we handle that? And then you can find out how great an organization is. And this is true of people, too. Um, so this is a real test of our organizational culture. This is a test of our organizational strength. This is a test of us as HR leaders, uh, how we perform during this uh, during this crisis. Culture always differentiates an organization. Um, not only in the talent marketplace, but also in the commercial marketplace. So um, the way your brand is perceived and the way your organization's culture is perceived in those marketplaces 
uh, will will determine whether you're able to compete and get better talent and whether you're able to win more business and be successful. Organizations with great cultures outperform poor, poor culture all day long, which is why there's that popular saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast or lunch or dinner or dessert or appetizer or any meal you want to think about. Culture will always win uh, when it goes up against strategy. And during this time, it's important to remember culture is tested during crisis, right? We'll find out how good our culture is. We'll find out how good we perform during this, during this, this time. And the decisions we make during this crisis will be long remembered by our employees. You know, when they start moving the COVID into the history books and we get this thing figured out and there's a cure and there's a, you know, this is not as pressing of a matter as it is currently. We're going to look back at this relatively small window in the history of our existence. And it'll be important to make sure, you know, we do the right decisions that align with our culture. And you'll be rewarded for staying true to your culture. So it may be hard. I'm going to show a couple of examples of how we've had to uh, think uh, long and hard about what, what to make the right decision. So here's a, here's a US case study. Uh, this is an actual thing that happened in our company recently. So our flagship client, which represents a fair amount of our revenue and our workforce, decided to halt all of our projects for six months. So we were faced with some decisions. One option, we could just adjust the workforce to whatever the remaining um, revenue stream was so that we could continue to be as profitable as we've been uh, we could go on our merry way. The problem would be a lot of our folks, it wouldn't be so merry. So this kind of conflicted with our employees' first culture. So that didn't seem like quite the right approach. Option two was we could keep everybody, but that might jeopardize the entire company because if we kept everybody, then we're gonna start spending money more than, you know, faster than we're making it. And we could put everybody's jobs at risk or the whole company at risk. So that's probably not the right strategy. And then we sort of said, maybe there's a blended approach, right? So we started thinking about, let's do some analysis. What's the cost to carry each of these employees compared to what we're, we're still making in a revenue stream? What's the net cost that's left? Let's take, uh, we're HR professionals. We promote the idea of a performance-based organization. Let's look at our performance management process. We just went through reviewing every single one of our employees. Let's find out who's a great performer and make sure we invest in those folks and let's address performance issues and, uh, and, and, and see how that fits in. So that's consistent with our culture, right? So you see in red, um, you know, things that conflict with our culture. Now we're talking about something that cons that's consistent with our culture. In the US, we have a term called furlough. I'm not sure if that translates well in, uh, in Nepal, but essentially we keep people on payroll, but we don't pay them anything anymore. It allows them to get access to unemployment benefits, which are very uh, lucrative right now, to be honest. Uh, we can still, we're gonna still cover their benefits, et cetera. So it was the most humane approach we could do um, to, uh, to be the least impactful to those that we had to take an action with while preserving as many opportunities as possible. And then many other people, we were able to actually do some great things. We could move some talent over to other clients. Uh, and then we were also able to focus on some special projects we haven't had time to get to. That's actually gonna generate more business for us. So as you can see, this last uh, scenario um, is, is, is very consistent with our uh, employees first uh, culture uh, and personal communication with each employee, both those impacted uh, in terms of being furloughed and those not being impacted. So everybody knew where they stood and we had that very personal communication. So that's consistency with our culture, um, you know, the, the transparency aspect that we're, that we're honest with our employees and we, we, we tell them what's going on. A second case study is in Nepal. As you all know, there's been a lockdown going on there. I understand the lockdown is on the tail end and maybe everybody gets to start you know, moving back towards uh, going to work on Monday and that's exciting. Uh, but the last few weeks has been a little bit challenging because uh, we can't get around and we can't go to offices and so on. So as that happens, again, we were faced with choices, right? One option was, hey, country's on lockdown. Nobody can go to work. We're just simply not going to pay people, right? No work, no pay. But that, you know, that, that has other ramifications for our employees that, that conflicted with our employee first culture. Our section op, a second option was we could just keep everybody on full payroll. Well, there's some risks with that because we're not generating any revenue, we're not going to work, and so that could put some undue burden that might have some uh, unintended consequences elsewhere in the company. So we had to be careful about that. So option three was kind of a combination. There were um, a, a few folks who were able to stay uh, you know, relatively productive. Uh, so they, they uh, you know, stayed on full pay. Those that 
didn't feel well enough to come to the office or there was some other reason why it wouldn't work out or too far away or what have you. Um, you know, we moved on to, on to half pay for the, you know, for those two or three weeks. Um, and they're, they, they've been very helpful uh, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, so by, by adopting option three, uh, you know, we're reinforcing the employee's first culture. So again, we have those moments, you know, we can, we can put it on posters, we can put it on our website, we can talk about culture till we're blue in the face. But when you actually get a chance to demonstrate what your culture means in your decision making, that's when your culture really starts to, to, to take hold and people understand exactly what, what's going on. So strategy three, uh, meet employee needs. So, um, so a couple things here. So March 12th and 13th were exciting days here at k and We were notified back to back from clients representing about 70% of our revenue that they are no longer welcome on their client site and they had to start working from home immediately. Thankfully, we had done some prior planning uh, so that we were able to convert pretty seamlessly, uh, but not everybody was fully prepared to be healthy and productive from home, right? It's different working from home, it takes a different kind of discipline. Some of us have done it before and it was an easy transition. Others, it was the first time we were doing it, so um, it brings its own challenges. And it was really important that manager and employee communication be emphasized this time as HR leaders really reaching out to those managers, making sure they're talking to employees. It um, also remembering that managers are also people, right? They're humans too. Um, so they need support as well. They're, maybe they're leading remotely for the first time and that's a different management skill than, than leading you know, when you're face to face with someone. Um, they're also dealing with the same challenges as other employees, you know, with their kids home from school and dealing with elder care issues and all the other things that are going on with lockdowns and, and uh, the sequester in place and all that. Um, and then we had to also take a look just operationally, make sure our, our procurement approvals and processes were streamlined. So if somebody needed a piece of equipment or access to something, we got out of the way and got that stuff as quick as possible for people. When it came to you know understanding more about how to be productive from home, um, it was you know within two weeks after that happened that we had our all hands meeting, which is as the name might imply, we all get together and talk about what's going on with the company. And John, we start we start every. John, I'm extremely sorry to interrupt you in between, but the session time remaining is only one minute fifty seconds. So, I think we should oh. continue with this, and we can re-log in with the same password and ID uh, after one minute. Will that be okay? Oh, that's that's perfectly fine. So, so we're we're stopping this, and I'm just logging right back into the same URL. Yes, yes, yes. Please, sorry for the uh, disturbance. No, no, no worries. All right, I'll see everybody in a couple minutes, I guess. Yes, yes. Thank you. Suppose I left. Please, very re-login. Go no la same password ID songa same meeting continue go no kulagi.